Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, wow, it's a full room. Um, my name is Jillian Munson, and this is Decorators 101, a gentle introduction to functional programming. So, small disclaimer, if you have any experience writing decorators or have some idea of functional programming, this may not be the talk for you, but if not, then stick around. So this is me, and here are a couple places you can find me on the internet, GitHub and Twitter. And when I'm not at conferences giving talks, you can find me at Nickelodeon, where I'm a software engineer currently working on the nick.com redesign, which just launched this past July. Um, it's actually been a really awesome and humbling experience getting to do usability testing with eight-year-olds. So <laughs> why decorators? Uh, I was kind of inspired to put together this talk after having some mildly disheartening conversations with some of my friends. I, as somebody who uses functional programming constructs all the time on the job in JavaScript, I was really excited about the concept of decorators in Python, and I tried to share this enthusiasm with some of my friends. So the conversations I had went something along the lines of this. So someone would come to me and say, hey, I'm writing this web app, uh, I've got these view functions, and I notice I'm repeating myself a lot in a few places, but it's doing something slightly differently in each case. Um, I, sh I could be doing this better, and I would respond, with, well, what about decorators? And some of the responses I got were along the lines of, do I need to decorate my code? Are you saying I need to add some comments? What, I, I don't understand. Are you saying my code's ugly? Now, if someone's saying that you could do something better by making use of decorators, they're probably not saying that your code is necessarily bad, inefficient, or ugly, but they probably are. So, <laughs> but why the aversion to decorators in the first place? Why the hesitation? So, I tried to find the root of this problem by approaching decorators as somebody who was just beginning with Python, and didn't necessarily have a background in computer science or programming language theory. And I do this all the time at work, and some people might call it usability testing, but I like to call it falling down the user hole, because if I've done my job right, by the end I have no idea where I am, how I got there, but I'm in a similar place as to where most of my users end up. So let's go down the Python decorator user hole together. So I'm just getting started with Python. I've maybe written one or two scripts, maybe a class, and I want to learn some more advanced features of Python, and this thing decorators keeps coming up in that context. So, all right, I go to Google, and I find python.org, the authority, right? So, I go to python.org, I find this FAQ, and it says, what is a decorator? Perfect, tell me, what is a decorator? A decorator is the name used for a software design pattern. Oh, well, okay, so it's not something I can use, it's just the way I can structure my code? Let's keep going with this definition. Decorators dynamically alter the functionality of a function, method, or class without having to directly use subclasses or change the source code of the function being decorated. Wait, how do, I don't understand. So it's a pattern, but it dynamically alters the functionality of a function. Does that mean I can change a function into an integer? I really don't get it. Oh, look, there's a link to Wikipedia. Let's see if maybe that'll explain it in a way that makes sense to me. <laughs> so I follow the link to Wikipedia where I land here. Okay, the article for the decorator pattern. W wait a minute, not to be confused with the concept of decorators in Python, but that's the thing I was trying to find out. I was misled. <laughs> Clearly, that's the article I need to be reading instead. So I follow the link, and I end up here. So. A decorator is any callable Python object that is used to modify a function, method, or class definition. Okay, so that seems kind of similar to what Mr. Functionality of Function was trying to say earlier, but I'm still not quite understanding what they're talking about. A decorator is past the original object being defined and returns a modified object, which is then bound to the... Okay, maybe they're just assuming I'm familiar with some concept that I'm not necessarily <laughs> understanding. They're assuming some base knowledge that I don't have. Let's keep going and see if they maybe explain it further. Python decorators were inspired by part by Java annotations. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. I'm not a Java programmer. I've never used Java annotations. That doesn't actually mean anything to me. <laughs> maybe the thing I'm missing are this thing called advices. So let's see if maybe that'll shed some light. And so I could keep going down this user hole and go through aspect and functional programming, but by the time I got here as someone who's not a beginner, I realized all of these conversations on decorators assume that the user understands some fundamental properties of functions in Python that the beginner doesn't necessarily know. So at this point, I'm gonna pause the conversation on decorators and start with the basics of programming with functions in Python. So if you've ever written a function, piece of code in Python, hopefully you've written a function. This is what a function looks like. This is a totally valid function in Python. It's declared with def, it has a name function, it prints a string, this happened, and that's it. There's no magic here. This is literally what it looks like. But if you look at the specification for functions in Python, all the way at the bottom of that documentation, you will find this interesting little note that has some fun facts about functions in Python. Specifically, that functions are first class objects. Well, that just explains everything. <laughs> functions are first class objects in Python. 
so what does that even mean to us? And I'm being a little sarcastic here, but I'm making this point because when I was an undergrad in computer science, professors would say things like functions are first class objects in JavaScript, functions are first class objects in Python. Like that was just self-explanatory and needed no further explanation. I'm not going to make that assumption. I'm going to dive into a little bit of what this tells us. So back to Wikipedia. This is the article on first class citizenship. <laughs> But this is really cool because since functions are first class objects in Python, everything in this definition applies to functions. So let's go through the explanation of what first class citizenship gives us. <laughs> in programming language design, a first class citizen object entity value in a given programming language is an entity which supports all the operations generally available to other entities. These operations typically include being passed as a parameter, returned from a function, and assigned to a variable. Those are really cool properties, and all of those things are properties of functions in Python. So yes, the moral of the Python decorator user hole and the programming of functions conversation is that in Python, we have this really cool ability to pass functions to other functions as a parameter. And based on that, we can write things like higher order functions. And a higher order function is really just a function that takes another function as a parameter and does something with it. So decorators are really just another name for higher order functions. Sweet. So let's see what we can do with this. So this is an example of a really, really basic decorator. It doesn't look too different from a function, right? So, which remember, decorators can be higher order functions. So let's go through this. So we have our function from before, except instead of function, I've named it decorated for clarity. It still just prints, this happened, that's it. Except now I've added some stuff. I've added this thing, decorator, which takes a parameter inner, and it defines a function local to it called inner decorator. There's nothing really magical happening with inner decorator. It's just a function that's local to decorator. It prints some stuff. It executes the thing that was passed to decorator. And remember, we can pass functions around as parameters, so inner can be executable. Print something that happens after that execution and return inner decorator. Now, that return statement makes the return value of decorator actually a function definition. So you can see I've added something really funky, this little at symbol at decorator. What that is is a Python interpreter directive. This says, hey, Python interpreter, when you define decorated, take that definition, pass it to a decorator, execute decorator, and then take the return value and redefine decorated. So when we execute this, this happens. So we actually execute inner decorator, which prints, executes our original function, and prints something that happens after it. Neat. The inner decorator thing, or just? It's the parameter. So that uh, Python interpreter directive actually tells it to pass decorated to decorator as a parameter. So this is neat. This is a cute example. But how can we make this useful to us? Well, what if I just print something that might be interesting to me instead of just this happened? So now I do the same thing I did before, except now I'm printing the current time before execution and the time after execution. So if I run this, I get a rough idea of how long it took my function to execute. And the cool thing is I can apply this decorator to any, fu any function and get the same kind of, like, I guess, runtime. So I can see which of my functions took the longest to execute. I just wrote a mini profiler using a tiny decorator. Yay. Useful. <laughs> well, that's great. So let's recap what we just did. So we created a function. We defined a decorator. We wrote the decorator such that it returns a function definition. And then we told the interpreter to pass a function to the decorator and replace that original function with the function definition returned from that decorator. Well, that's great and all, but what if we wanted to do something even more useful? What if we wanted to decorate a function that takes parameters and then do something <coughs> with those parameters? So here we have something that looks just like we were just looking at, except now our inner decorator takes an argument num copy. So decorated has number as a parameter. So what is num copy and where does num copy come from? I could kind of go into this a little bit, but I think I'll just run it because if you look, we've called decorated with a parameter five. It gets passed to inner decorator, and then when by the time inner executes in that inner function, the value passed to our original function is six. So we see that num copy actually gets assigned the value we passed to decorated. Well, that's great, but we can only use this decorator on functions that 
take one parameter. We can't extend this to functions that have multiple parameters. We can only access that first parameter. So how, how would we define our decorator to work with multiple with functions with different signatures? Well, pretty much the same way we would with any function that we want to take a variable number of parameters, we use args and quarks. And for those of you that may not know, args is basically a list of parameters that can pass to the function. Quarks is the key dictionary of keyword arguments that can pass to a function. So if we run this and we just look at the, what the um, interpreter assigns to args and quarks, um, we see that the same value that we passed to decorate it is, appears in quarks as, in, as part of the list. So that allows us to do some really funky things. So let's say we had these two functions decorated and also decorated. Decorated is still a, sorry, basically a print statement. And also decorated takes two new number arguments and prints their sum. So we have one decorator that has one function signature, counts the number of arguments being passed to the function, executes the function as originally intended, and then returns. So if we run this now, we see that it actually behaves as we expected. It counts the number of arguments successfully. It executes the function. Cool. <laughs> So with those three examples, we can do some really cool things with decorators. We can add some behavior that executes before and after our original function. We can grab the parameters being passed to the decorator function and do something with them. And we can apply the exact same decorator to functions with different numbers of arguments. So with those properties, we can do things like function profiling. We can validate input to a function before we execute it. We can format the output of a function. And more, the possibilities are literally endless. <laughs> But where do we go from here with our basic knowledge of decorators? We can actually write class definitions as decorators. We can write decorators that decorate other decorators, but we would probably have to go deeper. Decorator inception, deception? Uh, <laughs> we could look at, some, but my primary recommendation if you're really interested in learning some more advanced decorator techniques is to look at some examples of large Python programs and frameworks and learn how they implement functionality with decorators. And I mentioned Flask because it's one of my favorite examples that makes the use of decorators in a really cool way to do things like app routing and HTTP error handling. So where do we go to build on our knowledge of programming with functions? I highly recommend you look at some other really cool functional programming features that are already baked into Python, like iterators and generators, how those are useful and how you can make your code more efficient by using them. Closures, we actually wrote a closure with inner decorator and list comprehensions. But I also recommend that you look into functional programming in other languages as well, in purely functional languages, and read about things like pure functions and lazy evaluation, just to kind of give yourself an idea of different programming paradigms. So the meta lesson of this whole presentation, I started with the Python user hole, and I kind of had this realization that we really need to be more conscious about these potential user holes when we're writing documentation. Yes, at some point we can't assume zero knowledge, but, at, but we really do need, if we were going to say, hey, we're open source, we want everybody to join our community, we need to kind of go through that usability experience. So if you're really interested in this topic, here are some really cool links. That's actually a link to this presentation. It's self-referencing and also some other talks from PyCon this year that were actually more advanced on this topic. So that's my talk. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? Corrections? <laughs> no? I'll be very honest, most of my experience with Flask has been in 24-hour hackathons. So I kind of had the experience of, I need this to work out of the box, and it does. But when I go home and I actually look at the code, I'm like, well, how does it actually do these things? And I kind of, those are kind of my hobbies, because I write mostly JavaScript on my job. And to be honest, Python is a lot more readable and a lot more easy to understand. So I kind of do so stuff like that for fun. Days. So that's kind of how I got into decorators. So I thought I would kind of help other people stay out of the user hole by doing this. Oh, the first one.
Well, you need your decorator to return a function definition, right? Sure. So that's, I mean, you could have your decorator actually return a value, but then your decorator wouldn't actually be executable. So that's actually just a way, like the decorator is kind of the meta function for your inner function. Just, I guess there is some syntactic sugar because it's te technically replacing the original function with your decorator function definition. You could also write it that way too, but I like the annotations. I actually didn't keep going with the decorator pattern, so I'm not sh totally sure what that is, but um, I'm assuming since there's two separate Wikipedia articles, there's enough of a difference to merit them. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't. If you find out what decorator pattern is, maybe you should do a presentation and say why decorator pattern is different than decorators. <laughs> Closures, sure. Um, so inner decorator is actually a closure. So closures, in the general sense, are really just functions that have a defined scope within a larger function. So this dec inner decorator doesn't actually live outside of decorator. You can't actually call it from any of the other functions, but because it's returned, that's how we get access to inner dec. That's how we ex actually execute inner decorator. So. Um, let's say we had some variables that were global within decorator, like if we had um, var x equals 2, we could actually access that from within inner decorator, but we couldn't access that from, let's say, decorated, if that makes any sense. I actually had a little trouble with the idea of closures until JavaScript when you're kind of forced to really understand scope because you can have some very nasty memory leaks. So <laughs> this is kind of a small example of why of closures, but if you really want to understand why it's really nice or really desperate to understand closures, I highly recommend trying to do anything in JavaScript. <laughs> I did not answer that well. <laughs> Anyone else? Is there? Sweet. Well, if you have any more questions, I'll be around. And I think the only thing after this is lunch, so. I think. I suppose class objects. I, so everything you say about Python right now is applicable to JavaScript and, and Ruby. I actually didn't know that about Ruby, but that's awesome. I feel like you usually know two out of three. So, <laughs> yay, functional programming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi.